Hey guys, the file is most excellent here, and thanks for tuning in this video. And in this one, I actually want to talk some more about the topic of dualism. And so this will actually be a brief follow-up to my original video called Dualism, the Illuminati Religion, uh, which is still to this day the most popular video on my channel, actually. And so, you know, I figured why not give the people what they want and go a little deeper into this particular topic while you guys wait for my next big project which, by the way, will be Gnosticism, the religion of Antichrist, as that's the one that got the most votes on my community tab poll, and so it's already in the works, actually. But ironically, there's actually a bit of overlap between my original Dualism video and that upcoming project, especially since both heavily address Gnosticism. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and set the notification bell to all to receive all updates from my channel, since YouTube has basically decided that unless channels post regularly, they're not going to notify the subscribers when they get around to releasing some new content. And so make sure that you hit the bell and select all if you really want to know when I release new content. Because I'd love to release a video for you guys every day, but, you know, I care more about quality than quantity. And that means it takes a lot of time and work to put out my videos. And so hopefully that commitment of mine to quality content will earn your subscription and a place in the channels that you receive all notifications for. And if not, that's okay too. I just thought I'd let you guys know about the notification issue with YouTube. But to start things off, let me refresh your memory as to what the basic premise of the original video was. And so I started off by explaining a bit about Gnosticism and how Gnostics believe the God of the Old Testament is actually evil. And they also believe that he created this physical universe as a prison to trap man within, whose actual nature is that he's a spark of the true god that is transcendent of the world and even the Demiurge. And Demiurge is a title that they use for the god of the Old Testament. And so the Demiurge is not believed by the Gnostics to be the true god, but a lesser evil being. And Demiurge actually comes from a Greek word and it means architect or creator. But that's all really just Gnosticism 101. I mean, anyone who does a Google search can learn all that stuff in just a few minutes. But the radical claim in the video that really made waves was my asserting and defending the idea that the Demiurge in the minds of the elite Gnostics, or the Illuminati if you will, that he consists of two entities who are dualistically opposed by nature. I know that sounds weird at first, but as I demonstrate in the video, when you bring this basic concept to the table, there's so much occult symbolism and teaching that suddenly makes perfect sense. I mean, it's like when you find that one missing puzzle piece that finally makes sense of all the stuff that before just looked like pure chaos. And so the two entities, though, that make up this dualistic demiurge in the minds of these individuals are Adonai, which that's just a Hebrew name applied to God in the Old Testament. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the name, that's actually the name that God in the Old Testament applies to himself. But again, that's a no-brainer. Uh, everybody knows that the Gnostics believe that the God of the Old Testament is the Demiurge. But the second entity that's one half of this dualistic Demiurge is actually Lucifer. And Lucifer is also a name used in the Old Testament and is actually applied to Satan. And you can actually watch my other video I made called Is Lucifer Satan? for proof that Lucifer in the Bible is actually Satan, because some people argue that he's not. But what you also need to know is that in the minds of these particular Gnostics, Lucifer is actually benevolent. And so they contrast Adonai as like the god of darkness and evil against Lucifer, the god of light and good, as in these quotes I showed in the first video. And for even further proof, I'll show you this clip from Dr. Peter Jones, who got his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, and he's basically considered an expert on ancient Gnosticism. He's written extensively on Gnosticism, and you're going to hear him talking here about the Gnostic idea of God and the devil, or Satan, Lucifer, uh, existing as a dual or singular being together about the guest we have for you guys all this evening. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Peter Jones. He is the executive director over at truthexchange.com. Dr. Jones has more degrees than Bruce Lee. Trust me, it is a, he's an amazing man and I got a chance to see him while I was in Canada and I want to encourage you guys all to go and check him out online. Dr. Peter Jones, thank you for joining us on next week. I'm very honored, Jeff. Thank you for having me. But I want to, I want to actually go two different directions with this, Dr. Jones, if I may. And the first is, is one, I want to ask the question because this is an area of expertise for you. What is Gnosticism and how is this a resurrected no form of Gnosticism what we're seeing around us? In what ways can we spot it? To your question of Gnosticism, it's interesting that People think of Gnosticism as a form of uh, 
a binary distinction between uh, between matter and spirit. Yeah. So they don't see it as a one system, but one of the great experts in Gnostic thinking described Gnosticism as a twoism on a monist background. Carl Jung was introducing intellectuals to Western Gnosticism by rejecting the Christian faith and going through the ancient myths of Gnosticism, including the god of Gnosticism, which he described as a joining of God and Satan. And he developed all the... But essentially, this elite group of Gnostics hold the belief that in order to escape the physical prison that is our world, they actually have to synthesize, or that is, merge together, these two opposed entities so that they and their creation can be destroyed along with them. And of course, this idea sounds completely crazy, but I go into way more detail in the video about all this, and so when you see it all explained like that, it begins to make a lot more sense. I mean, it never makes complete sense, because it's all a crazy lie in the end, but I just meant that when you start to connect the dots, you can actually start to see why someone would believe such a thing as this. And so anyways, that's a brief refresher for those of you who may have watched the first video a while back. But seriously, if you haven't seen the original, I would recommend you just don't even bother watching this video, uh, because it probably won't make hardly any sense to you at all if you haven't. And so, first go and watch my original dualism video, and then come back and watch this one so that you'll be on the same page with where I'm going. And so, with all that said, let me show you some additional content to what I showed you in the first video. And one of the first things that I want to point out to you guys is a clip from the first Blade movie. And you actually need to remember for this what the great work is. And so, as the infamous occultist Aleister Crowley defined it, the great work is the uniting of opposites. It may mean the uniting of the soul with God, of the microcosm with the macrocosm, of the female with the male, of the ego with the non-ego. And so, the great work is essentially the synthesizing of opposites, all the way up to the two opposed demiurgs themselves, really. And if you think about it, it really goes beyond that, because ultimately, all this uniting of opposites is done to destroy the physical snare of man that is our world, and it's done to unite his soul with the true God, who they call the Source. And remembering, of course, that they believe that man is originally a spark of that true God to begin with, which, if you think about it, man returning to the Source is the merger of the two things that are the most opposite from one another in all of existence. Man and God. So they essentially see it as necessary to synthesize all the things in between first in order to accomplish this feat. And so this is the ultimate purpose of the great work really, that is the synthesis of man and God. And so with all that information, uh, you'll often see portrayed in their symbolism the idea of merging two opposites with the result of deification, or what's commonly called apotheosis. And this is actually perfectly portrayed here in Blade, because we see the main antagonist in the movie use Blade, who is a symbol of the combination of opposites, to deify himself. And what I mean by that is that Blade himself in the movie is portrayed as being half human and half vampire. Um, they actually call him the Daywalker in the movie because he basically has all the best qualities of both species, human and vampire. So, he's essentially a hybrid of the two opposed groups in the movie. That is, the protagonist and the antagonist both rolled into one, if you will. And ultimately, we see the main villain here put Blade into some kind of intricate device and use him as the quote-unquote key to unlock deification for himself. And this is exactly what the Elite are trying to do with the dual Demiurge. He, or they, that is Adonai and Lucifer, as a whole, are the key to the Elite's supposed deification. And there's also some other merger symbolism going on here, because you see these ruling elder vampires being held captive here. They're going to actually be merged into one in the main villain who's standing in the center of this whole ritual. And this whole setup here is actually going to become even more relevant with the next movie that we look at.
so here's actually a part where you see the main villain becoming what in the movie is called the Blood God, which is essentially like a vampiric god of some sorts. And then you can see here that after he becomes this Blood God, he becomes practically invincible and even develops superhuman or I guess you would say super vampiric powers of some sort. But the next one I wanted to talk about was the Dark Crystal movie, which I really wanted to feature it in the first video, but I just didn't have the space. But there's some serious dualism going on throughout this whole movie. I mean, to start all through it, you have these two opposed groups of the evil Skeksis and the benevolent Urus, or sometimes they're called mystics. But we even see in the film that the two groups are in this type of balance with one another. Just like how I pointed out that the elite view opposites, like good and evil. That is, they believe you can't have one without the other. So the idea would be that if you took one away, the other would cease to exist. And actually, I took that claim to task at the end of the video in my critique. But there's this scene where one of the Skeksis dies, and instantly one of the mystics also disappears with him, showing that one can't exist without its counterpart, and that they're in this finely tuned balance with one another. But in the end of the movie, these two opposed groups are actually merged together to form a single dualistic group, which are even portrayed as being godlike, uh, again pointing back to that apotheosis. And not to mention, look how similar all this is to the blade ritual that we already saw. And to top it all off, note the triangle and all-seeing eye symbolism here going on when the merger of these two groups takes place. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, man. The symbolism is ubiquitous. But here, this merger of the antagonist with the protagonist, like you have in Blade, would again seem to harken back to the merger of the ultimate villain and the ultimate hero in the minds of these elite Gnostics. That is, Adonai and Lucifer. But the resulting beings of the merger are even called the Urskeks, which is a plain combination of the original groups, the Urus and the Skeksis. What was sundered and undone shall be whole, the two made one! And of course, the synthesis that happens at the end of the movie seems to shatter this existing corrupt world that the movie takes place in, revealing a utopian paradise underneath which is undoubtedly an allusion to the destruction of our evil physical realm to give way to the heavenly spiritual realm believed to follow the synthesis of the Demiurgs. And even beyond all this, I think the crystal, that is the dark crystal the movie's named after, I think it's even a symbol of mankind's return to the source, because the whole plot of the movie revolves around the main protagonist trying to reunite a small shard of the crystal back to its source. Oh, the prophecy says you must find the shard. The crystal shard. The crystal shard? To save our world, Gilfling, you must find the shard. <laughs> and then when he finally does accomplish this, that's when the two groups merge and the whole world is set straight again. And so the shard seems to allude to mankind, who again, uh, Gnostics believe are a spark of the divine. And so the idea would be that man is like a single spark that came from a larger fire that is the source, the true god. And so the plot revolving around this idea of returning the shard back to its source to achieve the ultimate synthesis sounds quite a lot like the great work, where the ultimate goal is to merge man's soul with the source. And I know there's a new Dark Crystal series that just came out on Netflix recently, and I tried to watch some of it, but it was seriously so boring, I couldn't really get through any of it. So tell me in the comments if you guys have watched it and if you found anything related to what we're talking about here. But some less complex examples of this kind of symbolism would be, for instance, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Because this movie too has an allusion to the synthesis of the ultimate protagonist and the ultimate antagonist as well. But first off, you need to remember that the main villain Voldemort and Harry Potter are very closely connected, like the characters that we've discussed in other movies, in that a piece of Voldemort's soul actually dwells within Harry. But in this scene, from the end of the final movie, we see Harry and the main villain Voldemort go flying through the air, and they merge into one being that has all the features of both Voldemort and Harry Potter. Which again, I think obviously alludes to the synthesis of the dual demiurge, Lucifer with Adonai, that is. And then it's like right after this that Harry Potter kills Voldemort in this scene, which is also highly dualistic.
And you also have to keep in mind here that Voldemort already killed Harry Potter before this. So you technically have both Demiurge archetypes dying in this movie. Uh, some other stuff, though, that I wanted to point out is this reoccurring theme you may have noticed before, and that is the combining of two opposites to open a portal or a gateway. For example, again, you have Ghostbusters, where the gatekeeper and the keymaster are male and female, and their sexual union actually results in the opening of Gozer's portal. I am the keymaster. I am the gatekeeper. And another one from the last video is this portal that I showed from the Shivering Isles DLC for Elder Scrolls. And you can see here that it's two faces, almost certainly the two faces of Sheagorath and Jigalag, who as I showed in the video are meant to represent the dual Demiurge. And again, Sheagorath and Jigalag, if you remember, represent complete opposites. That is that they're the gods of chaos and order, respectively. And then at the end of the game, we actually find out that the two are one person. That's kind of like the Harry Potter thing that I was just talking about. And this is actually the portal that leads from the main game world into their realm. But ultimately, I think this portal symbolism here is meant to point to the synthesis of the dual Demiurge being the way to open the gate to the higher realm so that man can escape from this prison world that we live in. And especially since when the player goes through this portal, what they're doing is leaving the normative game world that they're always playing in, and they're going to a different, transcendent realm of that world. And ultimately, as I showed in the last video, the player becomes a god at the end of the whole thing. And so essentially what happens is the player goes through this portal, leaves the normal human plane behind him, and goes to the realm of the gods, which is called Oblivion, and then becomes a god himself. Kind of sounds familiar. It sounds a bit like Gnosticism and how man is supposed to be trapped in this realm and he needs to ascend to the spiritual realm to be merged with the source and become one with God. And so you have it all right there. All the symbolism comes together right there. But another thing that has similar allusions to this is the 2008 Alone in the Dark game. First of all, let me point out that this game is overflowing with occult symbolism. I mean, the main character you play as in this game is a paranormal investigator, and so it's chalked full of demon possessions and tons of other satanic stuff. And even the main villain in the game is an old bald white guy named Crowley, which is the leader of a cult that's trying to summon Satan. This guy is an obvious allusion to the occultist Aleister Crowley. And not to mention, one of the other characters in the game is named Hermes Trace Magus which, again, is a clear allusion to an occultist, because he's obviously based on the fictional character Hermes Trismegistus, where the occult philosophy of Hermeticism gets its name. But ultimately, the plot of the game revolves around trying to reunite the two divided halves of the Philosopher's Stone, another cult reference there, and upon merging the two pieces together, it actually opens a portal to the spiritual realm for Lucifer to come through and possess a human host body. This is the umbilicus between our world and the next. This is Lucifer's door to our world. Your stone, carrier. You are 
are wasting precious time. light announces Lucifer's arrival. When the light has filled the nine circles of the gate, Lucifer will be incarnated. Now, Carrier, this is why you followed the path of light. The stone is once again complete. Take it to face our enemy. Again here, you can see that the game has a crazy level of occult in it. And not to mention, that's probably one of the worst endings to a game that I think I've ever seen in my life. I mean, you get possessed by Satan, and then boom, the credits roll, and you're like, what? But something of note here is that reference to the Philosopher's Stone, because this is an actual occult idea too. And exoterically, that is, the outer meaning intended for the uninitiated public, is that the stone is a mysterious alchemical substance that can actually change base elements like lead into gold. Or it can even be consumed as an elixir that can grant the drinker immortality. However, the meaning of the stone esoterically, that is the hidden meaning meant for the adepts or the learned, is that the stone is the result of the great work. That is, the process of synthesis or merger, known as the great work, is ultimately meant to create the Philosopher's Stone. Well, of course, we know from coming at this from many other angles what the primary purpose of the great work is. It's to destroy the Demiurge in order to reunite man's spirit with the Source. So the stone ultimately represents apotheosis, that is, the merger of man and God. And so this is probably why some of the exoteric interpretations of the stone is that it grants immortality or enlightenment and even heavenly bliss. And the Philosopher's Stone is something I never really covered in the main video, but it's obviously a big part of occult thinking when it comes to the concept of the great work. But another quick one though, where you see some of the combining of two opposite halves to open a kind of portal, is Aladdin, where Jafar merges two halves of a golden scarab, and it actually opens the mystical Cave of Wonders. And I'm sure there's a million more examples like this one in movies that I can't even think of. So you guys can actually go to the comment section and tell me the ones that you can think of. And maybe if I get enough, I can make a quick follow-up video to this and I'll give you guys credit for your findings. But before I move on from this topic, I'd be remiss to mention the Nintendo Switch. I mean, look at this sucker. The symbol for it is literally a yin-yang, and for the remote you have allusions to the red and blue pillars on the left and the right, like I talked about in the last video. And then of course you have the screen in the center of the two doubling as the portal through which the player, you know, metaphorically enters the game world. So this thing literally couldn't be more in line with the symbolism that I talked about in my dualism video. 
Because if you remember, I talked about the Freemasonic symbolism of the two pillars, and the combination of the two opens the portal in between them. But another one that's almost as bad as the Switch symbolism was the Ready Player One movie. And in this trailer of it specifically, you can see the main character put his VR headset on to escape the poor conditions of the real world. And look at it, it's even branded on it with a 101 for the pillar and portal symbolism that we talked about. And if you remember, the ones represent the pillars in the sequence, and the zero is the portal that opens between them. But even beyond that, when the camera zooms in there, you see inside the headset and it fills with red and blue symbols, and then you go flying through this big O, which I think again confirms the 101 symbolism here, because the zero or the O, I mean it doesn't really matter whether it's a number or a letter because they're not really using to spell or count, but the O here again becomes the portal through which the character escapes the terrible conditions of his real world. My name's Wade Watts. My dad picked that name because it sounded like a superhero's alter ego. But he died when I was a kid. My mom too. And I ended up here. Sitting here in my tiny corner of nowhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere. Except the Oasis. And that would be similar to the idea that man is supposed to escape this terrible situation that he's in. That is, he lives in the snare of the Demiurge. But you also have the one-eye symbolism present here. And let's not miss that when he finally gets through the portal, everything's purple. And I talked about this in the last video, where the combination of the colors of red and blue is purple. As in, like, if you took red paint and blue paint, you mix them together, you get purple. And so then, purple ends up being used by these people as basically the symbol of synthesis or merger or the great work. And so, just think back to the Dark Crystal movie that I showed you. The crystal in the movie is purple. And remember the whole point of the Dark Crystal was that you take that shard, which represented mankind, and you return it to its source, you merge the two together. And you can also see the same kind of symbolism going on in the clip from the Ghostbusters movie that I already showed, where you have the combination of the Gatekeeper and the Keymaster, and the lightning that connects them together to open the portal is actually purple. And so, like I was saying in the last video, purple turns out to be a color that they like to use to symbolize the great work, or synthesis. And so when you're going into the headset to begin with, and you haven't fully entered the VR realm, you're seeing the red and blue symbolism separate from one another, and then the merger occurs inside the portal, and the two become one, and then boom, purple. And so again, perfectly aligns with the symbolism we talked about in the first video. But moving on from there, I wanted to talk a bit about some other stuff that I cut from my video to save time, which goes back to the conversation about the Masons. And I talked a lot about their symbolism, especially about their pillar symbolism and the symbolism of their crest. But the thing that I removed and that I really wanted to show you guys involves this graph again. And what you have to keep in mind here is that this chart wasn't made by me or some Joe Schmo. This was actually made by Freemasons for a magazine article. And so think about what you're seeing here. I mean, you have the whole Freemasonic order, which is supposed to be one organization, and it's split right down the middle between the two rites of Scottish Rite and York Rite. Well, the Scottish Rite is known, even by many Masons, to be overtly Luciferian. For instance, Albert Pike, the one who wrote positively about Lucifer in Morals and Dogma, was a sovereign grand commander in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And he even developed many of their rituals that they use to this day. And so my theory here is that each rite represents one of the Demiurgs. And to start, notice you have the two pillars here. And remember, the pillars represent the two Demiurgs. Well, each set of steps that represent the two different rites, the Scottish and the York, each one has a pillar standing in front of it, likely alluding to the fact that they share the same symbolism in common. And we can even see that many of the ranks on the York right side are things that are at least loosely associated with Christianity. For instance, you have the Order of the Red Cross, the Order of the Knights of Malta, and the Order of the Knights Templar, which all three of those are actually based on actual Roman Catholic groups. 
But also you need to keep in mind that with this rank of Knights Templar at the top, unlike every other rank in Freemasonry, this one you actually have to make a profession to be a Christian in order to achieve this rank. But most tellingly of all is that a couple of these figures on the York right side are actually associated with the temple of the God of the Old Testament, Adonai. So for instance, you read in the text up there in the top left corner that the Mark Master on the bottom step of the York right is actually a temple worker. And then there on the third step you have the most excellent master well up in the top left corner and actually calls him a tribesman of Israel, which Israel is the people of God that the God of the Old Testament led out of Egypt. And yet again, if you look on the sixth step of the York Rite, you'll see the Order of the Red Cross, and it tells us that that is actually King Hiram of Tyre, which he's actually the one that helps Solomon build the Temple of the Lord. But the most obvious one is definitely on the fourth step, and it's called the Royal Archmason. And the text in the corner, again, tells us that this is actually the High Priest of the Jews, in other words, this represents the high priest of Adonai himself, the one who goes into the temple of Adonai and serves him day and night. And another very telling rank across the way on the Scottish right side is the 25th degree called Knight of the Brazen Serpent. So one of the ranks from the Scottish right is literally named after a serpent from the Bible. Well, who's the serpent in the Bible? That would be Satan, aka Lucifer. And so again, I think what we have here is two opposed halves that converge at the top of this pyramid-like structure. One half being the Scottish Rite, which represents Lucifer, and the other half being the York Rite, which represents Adonai. And note too that the York Rite side, the Adonai side, is made to appear much harder since it doesn't have the luxury of easy-to-climb steps. And we also see here the two highest ranks from both the York and the Scottish Rite stand above the whole thing, holding the crest, which, again, I said represents the merger of Adonai and Lucifer, and, again, it's branded with that G that refers to the Demiurge, the architect. And also, let's remember how closely associated both of these top ranks in Scottish and York Rite masonry are with the two Demiurges. Because, again, you literally have to be a professing Christian to gain this rank of the Knights Templar. And so that's a forced connection that this mason has to have to the god of Christianity. Well, just ask any Christian and they'll tell you that their god is the god of the Bible, the whole Bible, including the god of the Old Testament, Adonai. Because Christians obviously accept the god of the Old Testament to be their god, unlike Gnostics. And these people know this. I mean, they're not stupid. They know that. They know that Christians worship the god of the Old Testament and think of him as their god. They think the god of the New Testament and the god of the Old Testament are one and the same. And this is the way they want it. They're not dumb. They know that. And they just want these two ranks to be the embodiment of the two opposed demiurgs. Because let's not forget what Albert Pike said about the highest ranks of the Scottish Rite maintaining their religion in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. And notice specifically in his quote that he's only addressing Scottish Rite Masons and not York Rite. Because he specifically says in it that he's talking to the Sovereign Grand Inspector General and then also the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. Well, those aren't even in the York Rite, so he's definitely only talking to the Scottish Rite Freemasons here. And also, he really only has any authority in Scottish Rite Freemasonry because he's not a York Rite Freemason. And so yet again, we see that these two separate rites, they're literally polar opposites. One is supposed to honor and admire Lucifer and the other Adonai, the god of the Bible. And so from seeing all this, it's clear what's going on here. I mean, this final rank is obviously just yet another symbol of the dual demiurge being synthesized here on this top step. And so masonry is just chock full of this symbolism of the fusion of opposites. You have the two pillars, you have the crest, and now you can see it even comes right down to the two rites that someone can even join. Because one of the rites, the York rite, seems to be all about the god of Christianity, and the other rite, the Scottish rite, seems to be all about Lucifer. And yet, in the end, the highest ranks seem to merge at the top here. And so this would seem to imply that at the highest ranks of Freemasonry, these two concepts, these two worldviews, are synthesized. They're brought together and it results in the Gnostic worldview, where you have both Lucifer and the God of Christianity synthesized together to deify man. And that's ultimately why they're showing it on these steps, because it's meant to portray the ascension of man to godhood. It's all about climbing the stairs of heaven, being exalted and going upward. And when you reach this final step, it's when you've achieved apotheosis. 
And if you think about it, look over there in the top right corner of the picture. You have the all-seeing eye of God, and then around it is the G. Well, Masons will even tell you that the letter G there represents God. And then if you notice, that line that sticks out of the side of it is perfectly in line with that top step. Again, making the point that when you reach this final step, you're achieving godhood or gnosis or exaltation, illumination, enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. This is the kind of symbolism that they're trying to portray here. And so obviously the symbolism of the stairs and the eye here, it's pointing to the apotheosis of man. And again, you have to keep in mind here that this final step where you reach apotheosis is where these two opposite sides of the staircase meet. The Scottish Rite and the York Rite. Here's where they merge and become one. And what do you know? That's where apotheosis takes place, at the center of this merger of opposites. And so when it comes to joining Freemasonry while professing to be, you know, a quote unquote Christian or some other religion like Islam or whatever, they allow that because this system is literally put in place to eventually remove those beliefs from the Mason uh, by the end of this whole process. Because you see, it doesn't matter to them. They see all these gods like Allah or Adonai or Krishna or whoever else as just another portrayal of the Demiurge. But they've literally created this type of system to draw in people from whatever religion and lead them inexorably upward to the enlightenment that their god and Satan are actually two halves of the same whole. And that by merging the two, man can reunite with God and become God. And so obviously there's an illusion of freedom when it comes to religion and creed, but really the goal of the system is to remove such things and to you know, eventually initiate the Mason into this Gnostic worldview. And before I leave the topic of Freemasonry, I actually want to play this clip for you guys out there who still have your doubts about Freemasonry having connections to Gnosticism. And really quick for background on this clip, the speaker is Dr. James White, and he's actually a church historian. He teaches church history on a scholarly level, and he's not really into this kind of conspiracy theory stuff that we're talking about here, so he's not really a biased source. And so what he says here is purely based on historical facts and not at all biased by what we're talking about. It's from the Greek term gnosis, which means knowledge. Uh, they, they taught that uh, salvation came through obtaining secret knowledge which was offered through the various rites and rituals uh, of their religion um, basically you were taught that you were a spark of the divine and that um, being reabsorbed back into the divine and the loss of your own personality really was your truest goal uh, but this was only meant for the enlightened uh, this was this was information that was not meant for the hoi polloi, the the people of the of the land, but uh, was only for the initiated ones, and you obtained it by going through masonic like rituals and and ordinances and things like that. So uh, that's that's the origination of the term. You obtained it by going through masonic like rituals. And so hopefully you can see from that clip that there are really connections between the modern Freemasons and the ancient Gnostics. I mean, it basically seems like the Gnostics realized that they had lost the battle against the Christian church, and so they just revamped their entire system, renamed themselves, and made their doctrines even more esoteric and secret. But before I close here, I want to remind you guys of the solution to all of this darkness that we just went over, and that is the cross of Christ. Because it's one thing to sit back and shake our fist at this darkness that's going on, but even these individuals behind all this, they need to be saved out of it, because the true conspiracy behind all this is a spiritual one, and our enemies are demonic in nature, not human. And so really, if you think about it, in that way, these people are victims. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, they're sinners, they've brought this on themselves, but also in a way they're being used. And so really, the only way to come against something spiritual like this is with a spiritual response, a spiritual message, and that message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I mean, it's simple. In fact, it's too simple. It's so simple that people like this, they want something more complex. They're not satisfied with the simplicity of the gospel. They don't want grace. They want to earn their salvation from God. They want to make God their debtor. They want to earn salvation from him and put him in a place where he owes them because that exalts them. That makes them think highly of themselves when they can make the great and glorious God owe them something. 
And so really they think of the gospel of Christianity as being too simple. And so instead they want something more complex that requires, you know, the study of ancient pagan religions and, you know, every esoteric occult idea ever to try and save themselves. But come on, man, if you're so smart, why can't you just see the ridiculousness of that? I mean, look how weak and fragile we are. Look how weak you are. You can't even save yourself from choking on like a piece of gum, let alone from eternal death. I mean, how could you possibly believe that? It's counterintuitive even. No, you need to be saved. You need another to do what you can't do. Because you know deep down that you're sinful and evil and you think evil things every single day. And so you need someone else to take your punishment for all the wrong that you continuously keep on doing. And I mean, what do you think? That doing good now is going to erase what you've done in the past? That's absurd. And besides that, you can't even be good enough now either. I mean, you think an infinite being like God, who is absolutely perfect, would accept your best deeds as being good? No way, man. He's perfect, and his standards are infinitely higher than yours. And so what you really need is someone else's goodness credited to your account. Someone whose deeds do satisfy the perfection of God. And so what you need is the atoning death and righteousness of Jesus Christ, because he's the only one who's ever lived up to God's perfect standard. Because he is God, wrapped in flesh. And he came and he bore the curse of your evil upon himself so you wouldn't have to. He became your sin so that you could become his righteousness. And the thing is with this, you don't have to work your fingers to the bone to have access to this. You don't have to search and search and search. It's always been there right in front of you. Wouldn't you expect that from the creator who loves you? That's what he would do. He would placard it right in front of your face and make it plain and clear as day. And he wouldn't make it all about you and you having to accomplish all these different things in order to earn salvation from him. No, all you have to do is run to Christ like a child runs into the arms of their father when they're in need of help. You just have to give up on trying to save yourself by your own knowledge and efforts and wisdom and gnosis and trust in the all-wise God to save you. Let him be your gnosis. And if you let go of your prideful grasp on your own goodness and your own deeds and your own knowledge and wisdom and all those things, and you clutch on to Christ, you hold on to him and trust in him and his work alone apart from anything else to save you, and he will credit to your account the righteousness that only God incarnate could merit. And if you'd like to hear more about the saving power of Jesus' gospel, I would encourage you to watch my most recent gospel video, The Gospel Part 2, Discovering the Gospel. And I'm confident that if you watch that to the end, you'll see just how superior the Christian gospel is to any other worldview's method of salvation. Because while it's easy to be saved by it, like I said before, it's still intellectually rigorous and mind-blowingly elaborate. And I mean, this is why it's been rightly said that the gospel of Christianity, you know, it's shallow enough for children to wade in, and yet it's deep enough for a giraffe to drown in. And so I'll leave that linked up at the end of this video, and also in the description box below. And so go ahead and check that out if you get the chance. And I mean, even if you're a born-again Christian already, I guarantee you, if you haven't seen it already, you'll learn a ton from watching it. And also remember that, you know, as Christians, we need to be refreshing our minds by setting them upon the gospel of Jesus. It's not really enough if we just sit around studying conspiracy theories and stuff like that that, you know, expose us to all this evil. But we need to counterbalance that with the study of God's truth, which would first and foremost be Christ himself and his gospel. And so again, I encourage all of you to go check that video out if you get the chance. And I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, I hope the video was edifying in some way to you. And again, if you found yourself confused about a lot of what I was talking about here, it's probably because you need to go watch or re-watch the first Dualism video. And I have it linked up in the description box, so be sure to revisit that if necessary. And also don't forget about my backup channel, The Christian Video Vault. I try to release a video on there every Saturday afternoon, and so there's a ton of useful content on there that you guys should check out. And you can actually see all the mini video thumbnails scrolling across the screen here that are on the channel.
so yeah there's a ton of content on there and more coming every week and so be sure to subscribe to this channel and that channel and watch any of these videos that pique your interest and again the link to that channel will be in the description and with that i love all you guys and as always godspeed